All right, well, as we uh, start out this morning, I want to start by uh, asking you a, uh, a question. And the question is, where are you from? Now, I'm, I'm not asking you what city you were uh, born in. Um, I'm, I'm really asking, where are your ancestors from? In other words, before your ancestors came on the shore of the Americas, where do they come from? Now, you, you may be first generation, so you may answer, that's easy, I came from. But where did your ancestors come from? What is your background? For, for me, it's, it's, I know a little bit uh, on each side. My mom's side, it's a little bit difficult because she was adopted. I know enough to know that she's Scotch-Irish, so I'm quarter Scotch and quarter uh, Irish, but I don't, we don't know anything beyond uh, my mom. My dad, however, I know a little bit uh, more of because, um, uh, you know, he had parents and grandparents and so forth. And usually when I talk about uh, our historical roots, my family roots on my dad's side, uh, I usually frame it in terms of a movie. And so if you've been around, you guys know, probably know what I'm going to talk about next, right? This picture will kind of give you a hint, <laughs> right? The movie is Fiddler on the Roof. And besides, the, and a play as well. Uh, um, and one of the reasons I love this is not just because I, I like musicals, and I'm man enough to say I like musicals, um, but, but because it is, like I say, a little bit of a family movie. The movie is set in Russia, but it's centered around a small community of Jews that are living in, in Russia. And at the end of the movie, they are forced to leave their little village by the Russian government. Now, this movie, the central character is Tevya. And Tevya uh, is, um, he, as a dairy guy, he goes around and delivers dairy. He's a follower of God. He's a good, good Jew. And um, he also has, he's poor and has five daughters, which makes him wonder what he did wrong um, in the Jewish culture. And, and you see this struggle. There's, there's two primary struggles in this movie. The first is, there is the tradition of being Jewish. And then there's the rising um, modern times. And anyone who has kids right now in the Bay Area understands this, right? There's the tradition of how we were raised, and then there's the rising modern times. I had many discussions this week which revolved around the fact that when we were, the ki when we were kids, you were punished by the fact that you couldn't go out and play. That was the punishment. Now you're punished when they make you go out and play. <laughs> My have times have changed. And so part of this, this movie is this, but the other part is this conflict of these Russian Jews who live in a country that is somewhat, not really, kind of like America, Christian. And this conflict between living in Christian in Russia and being Jews and all that arises out of that. Now, this is a fictional story. Tevi is a fictional character, but it does reflect some realities. Between 1881 and 1914, history tells us that um, due to circumstances of violence and political oppression brought on by the rule of the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, over two million Jews left Russia. 1,749,000 of them headed toward the United States. Two of those, at least, were my grandparents. Right. Now, they were kids at the time. They came with their families through Ellis Island and ended up in um, somewhere around the Philadelphia area. And that's where my grandmother and my grandfather met. Now, in the story, Fiddler on the Roof, there is a tailor named Model Kamzoi. And he's the guy on, on your right there. Tevye in the movie is the guy on the left, and then the, the daughter, uh, his oldest daughter's in, in the back, and you can fill in the blanks there. Um, my grandfather was a tailor. And so you, you see now how this is kind of a family movie, kind of explains kind of what happened, my grandfather being a tailor. Now, my grandfather's last name was not Kamzoil. I mean, that would be really awesome, great story to tell. Um, in fact, you might even think his last name was King, but it wasn't. 
Um, I really don't know what his last name is from the Russian side, but when he came through Ellis Island, they changed his last name to Woodnick. I, I know, you're like, wait a second. You're a, ha, what? Uh. They changed his last name to Woodnick. And so my, my father, when he was born, was Sidney Taylor, because my grandfather was a tailor, Sidney Taylor Woodnick. And my father, at about the age of 11 years old, got involved in radio ministry. And it was at a time when being ethnic and Jewish wasn't the best thing in the world. And so my father, for radio's sake, decided to change his last name. Now, my grandmother's Russian last name was Kinnikstol. And it means keepers of the throne. So it has a royal tinge to it. It doesn't necessarily mean we were royalty, but it has that tinge. And so my father chose the last name King uh, to kind of reflect her maiden name. Uh, for radio. The interesting thing is this. This was in a day and time where, where you could just change your last name. So, so when I was born, my dad's driver's license said King, his passport said King, all his credit cards said King, and he had never legally changed his name. <laughs> now, you can imagine, uh, um, actually, I was born, I was really the first male King in our family. And it wasn't even uh, till I was a teenager and all the stuff happens that uh, they found out my dad's not legally king and he actually had to change his last name for the first time. So we're not related. I have one little brother whose, name, whose last name's king. We're not related to any other kings. Uh, we are first generation kings, if you would. <laughs> so I, t I tell you the story, A, to tell you a little bit about myself, but also to kind of illustrate the fact we are all here immigrants. We are all, unless you're Native American, and I, I haven't run into anybody who's at least all Native American, um, unless you're Native American, we are, we are all immigrants to this country. It may not have happened this generation, last generation, but we are relatively a young country, and we all eventually came from somewhere else. Now, we are in a series called Extra Extra, where we talk about where our faith intersects with issues that are, that are coming up in the headlines. And so today we're going to talk about how our faith intersects with the issue of illegal immigration, really immigration overall, but specifically this issue of illegal immigration. Uh, I could have done this any week. It is a huge topic that will be uh, continued to talk about all throughout the election. Um, obviously, there are different opinions and sides, and, but it, it is a hot topic. Uh, it's, it uh, starts anywhere from President Obama himself, declare the issue would be key in the presidential uh, bid. He also, of course, kind of helped that by um, being proactive and making some decisions to help uh, at least probably about half of those who are, are uh, uh, undocumented immigrants to actually become, or for at least a season, about three-year time, uh, um, not under the scrutiny of the law, if you would. Uh, there is a court battle. You've probably heard about this recently. There's a huge court battle over the president's decision to do that, whether or not he legally could, whether or not it was a smart thing uh, uh, to do. A judge put a junction, a stop on that, and it probably will make its way all the way to the Supreme Court. And of course, uh, every other day or so, someone is talking about this issue in the current political rhetoric, whether it be the Democrats or the Republicans or the independents. It is a major issue that everyone wants to know, where do you stand as we go in to this political season? So it's a hot topic. I'll be honest with you. When I, when I first latched on to this, I, I had some scriptures in mind, thought I can develop these. And then I started getting into it and I was like, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. What am I thinking? But here we go. So um, it, this is the running definition. And actually, i got to say one more thing before we run into this. Like everything else I've taught during this series, you got to listen to the whole thing. So if you don't like something up front, don't worry. I'll pick on the other guy by the end. Okay? So I just want to give you that little reminder. So here's my running definition, if you would, of, of illegal immigration. It's the act by foreign nationals violating a nation's immigration laws by either entering the country without government permission or, once lawfully entering, remaining within the country beyond the termination date of a temporary visa. Okay, it's just the, just the basic 
definition of what it is. And kind of before we kind of jump in, into this, I want to um, establish a couple of, or several of you would, facts. Uh, some things that I learned along the way. So here's several did you know, okay? Did you know? First of all, did you know, this probably is, is something you do know, the United States remains a popular destination attracting about 20% of the world's international migrants, even though it represents less than 5% of the global population. So we are relatively a small country, actually. We are relatively a small country, but 20% um, um, of immigrants every year are coming and entering into the United States. Did you know, this is one that kind of surprised me, approximately 80 million people, or almost one quarter of the U.S. population, is either of the first or second generation. Wow. Now, I'm not talking about those, this isn't just illegal immigrants, this is Im immigrants, period. So almost a fourth, we're about 300, I think 60 million people in America, somewhere around there, 80 million are either just came over from uh, or, uh, another country, their first generation, or they have kids and their second generation. Now, those of us who live in the Bay Area, um, that's probably not so surprising. Uh, you just, for, if you, especially if you work in the tech world or in a school or whatnot, you just kind of look around and you're like, this is an international place. But across the country, maybe Connecticut, um, it, it, may not, it may not seem that way. But there's a lot of folks here that, that we live with, that may be you, that are first or second generation. We are an immigrant society. Now, according to the DH Office of Immigration Statistics, and this is an estimate, 11.4 million unauthorized immigrants reside in the U.S. And this is of January 2012. They haven't done a recent study that I could find, so it's probably a little bit more. Now, the highest share of that 11.4 million unauthorized immigrants reside here in California. 28%, almost a third. So if, if you're wondering why we're talking about that, you must be new to California. Uh, because uh, uh, it, is a, it is a huge, divisive issue here in California, but it's the reality of the world that we live in. Um, in total... There are 4 million United States-born children of illegal immigrants that reside in this country. This was as of uh, two years ago, I, I believe. So 4 million kids that have been born in the United States uh, from folks who are undocumented. Now, infants, according to the law, are, according to the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, are American citizens from birth. So that means that there are, are 4 million kids who are citizens of this country, who at, at least has one parent who is not, and is here, it's undocumented and technically illegal. That's kind of a big issue. All right? So I want you to keep those things kind of in the back of your mind as we kind of move forward. You hear a lot of rhetoric, but those are some of the facts that most people pretty much say, oh, yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Now, as I dive into this, I just want to say ahead of time, I understand this is a complicated issue. And like I said before, when I started getting into this, I'm like, what was I thinking? Because, you know, you want to start with a place of kind of common knowledge of, you know, here is the state of the way things are. And it's, it's, just, it's not clear cut at all. And so let me just say ahead of time, as, as we kind of dive into the complication of this, I am not going to tell you how to vote or who's right and who's wrong. That is not, that is not my job. My job is um, to teach what I believe um, God wants us to hear in terms of what it means to follow him. And so before we jump into that, I just want to, say, I want to, just want to say, kind of get us a picture of how complicated this issue is. So that you see, like I said, there's different sides. One article I came across, come up here. Uh, there's 100 women that are marching the Pope is going to go meet with the president in uh, next month in September. And uh, they are marching 100 miles to D.C. Uh, to inspire Pope Francis to keep talking about immigration. And specifically, to keep the fire under the president. And you can't see it, but down there uh, below that 
it, it actually, there's a little headline that says um, that the key issue is kids being separated from their families. That's the issue for them. And so, for instance, let me just tell you a true, true case of two teenagers. One day, Ronald Sr. dropped off his kids, Cessia, 17, and Ronald Jr., 14, at school in Pompano Beach, Florida. When Ceci and Ronald Jr. came home to an empty house at the end of the day, they realized that something was wrong. Then the phone rang. It was their father, who explained that when he returned home that day, he found U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents waiting for him at his doorstep. Sosa had been an undocumented immigrant from Nicaragua, and he was taken to a detention center. He tried to reassure them that everything would be okay. Now, a 17-year-old daughter, Cecia, says this. She says, even though we knew that my father might get deported, we never thought that it would actually happen, especially since ICE already took our mother away five years ago. But it did happen. Ronald Sosa was deported to Nicaragua, joining his wife, Maricela. Suddenly, the teen's parents were gone, and the Sosa children, 14 and 17, faced a frightening future with foster families and unfamiliar schools. Now, my heart goes out. My heart goes out. On the other hand, you cannot be in the barrier and not recognize what's happening here in this picture. Kate was with her father at the pier in San Francisco, just enjoying a beautiful day, which this is a good day to be at church because the traffic going to San Francisco today is terrible. And they were enjoying that, and they were on the pier when a shot rang out, and Kate uh, was killed. Um, they found the guy who did it because there was pictures and video and all kinds of stuff, and it turned out to be Francesco Sanchez. And the big issue, as you probably, most of you know, is that Francisco is uh, a undocumented immigrant. He's actually been deported five times already. And he had snuck back across. He had committed a, a crime, thievery, and he was arrested and he served time. When his time was up, ICE was going to send him back uh, one more time, but he had an open uh, felony in San Francisco for uh, drug marijuana, which I didn't even know was illegal in San Francisco. But that, that's what he was wanted for. And so they took him to San Francisco as the law required to stand trial there. Well, they didn't want to uh, press charges. And even though it, it was requested that if you're going to let him go or whatever, let us know because he needs to go back home. They did not because they're a safety city and a sanctuary city, I think is what it's called. And they let him go. And a few weeks later, uh, this shot rang out. Now, I think everybody who's looked at this case does not believe that um, he was targeting her. It was an accident. I don't know whether he shot on purpose or not. Uh, he shot her, though. And he shouldn't have been in the country. And so, obviously, there's this rage that someone who doesn't even belong in this country in the first place, let alone is a known criminal, was out there and this young lady died. Another uh, story that I came across is in response to President Obama's decision uh, to allow probably about half of the undocumented workers, like again, this kind of temporary legal status. And I found, came across this um, article written by Gesar Gubernov. He's one of the four million plus people that are waiting to hear on their document status. And he writes this. In 2011, with a few, few thousand dollars in my pocket, I arrived in this country, United States, seeking shelter from persecution and corruption that forced me to leave my home in the Republic of Azerbaijan. I crossed the border legally. I had a valid entry visa to come to the United States. Additionally, although it was tempting, I never accepted illegal employment opportunities, and I did not take any shortcuts in my pursuit of the American dream. He writes, when President Obama announced his willingness to bypass Congress and act unilaterally 
to enforce immigration changes that will offer legal paperwork to millions of undocumented immigrants, I and many others in my situation felt devastated. In order to process millions of new applicants, the immigration authorities will have to draw tremendous administrative resources and incur substantial costs. This will happen at the expense of other applicants who are already waiting in queue and are oftentimes backlogged into the system. As a matter of fact, I read stories of folks that have literally been waiting for 20 years to get a decision as they go through the legal process. In other words, by granting paperwork to millions of undocumented immigrants, we treat unfairly those immigrants who come to the U.S. legally. Their paperwork will experience significant more delays than any incentives for them to stay here legally will be diminished. And again, my heart goes out. Now, I haven't even begun to tell all the the other multiple uh, stories and, and situations of how uh, undocumented immigrants are, are sometimes enticed here, um, are, are ab- abused and taken advantage of, or the situations that they run from back home. I mean, this just, this is so many tentacles to it. It is not an easy situation. And, I, I, and I'll just be honest with you, I pray harder for our president this week than I have maybe last week. I mean, every time I study something that the guy has to make a decision about, that our Congress has to, I'm a little less critical and a little bit more prayerful. Because it's just not as simple as they make it sound in the sound bites. It's a complicated situation. And like I say, if, if, if you're here in California for any length of time, you may be undocumented yourself. You probably know someone who's undocumented, and your definitely life is affected by this issue. And so what I want to do is I want to turn our attention to Scripture. But again, I want to tell you ahead of time, I don't mean to kind of say, here's, the fi- here's God's opinion on the matter, final. I want to give you principles to frame the discussion in and to respond to. Because uh, to be honest with you, there is no passage that says, this is how you deal with undocumented immigrants. I looked, lar- I mean, I looked high and low to just see what people had to say and, and going through the scriptures. It's, we just live in a different world than when the scriptures were written. Now, there was immigration to a certain degree, but it looked vastly different. It was more about being conquered and the conquerees than, than really people going from one country to another and literally becoming citizens of that country. It, it's an it's a entirely different situation. So what I want to share with you is a biblical perspective, but what I've had to do is find biblical principles that relate to these different issues rather than a once and for all, this is what God says on the matter. Is that, is that fair enough? Okay. Before we go to the first passage, which is in Proverbs, again, I want to kind of share with you a, a, what I believe is a true historical story. At least the account is close to what happened. Uh, Many of you may be familiar with the Battle of Waterloo. It's a huge deal in history when Napoleon was defeated. Uh, On one side of the two, uh, there's the Prussians, and then there is the English led by the Duke of Wellington. When they won that battle, every year, the Duke, along with uh, the surviving soldiers of the Battle of Waterloo, would come together in an annual banquet. At one of these annual banquets celebrating the victory at Waterloo, the Duke of Wellington, after dinner, Uh, with this group of soldiers, handed around, just so folks can see, a very valuable presentation. It was a snuff box with diamonds in it. It's just beautiful. After a time, though, it disappeared and could be found nowhere. Now, you imagine the Duke was a little upset, annoyed at this, and the guests, being faithful soldiers to the Duke, uh, um, were even more upset even more disturbed. And they all agreed to turn out their pockets just, just to make sure that no one was taking it and, and everybody was above board. And they began to do that. But one old officer uh, objected. And on their pressing the point, he just simply left the room. Now the Duke kind of stood up and he begged that nothing more might be said about the matter, that it wasn't really that big of an issue. But of course, suspicion fell on the old officer. Nobody seemed to know much about him or where he lived. The next year, at their annual 
banquet, the duke was there with all these soldiers once again. And he put his hand in the pocket of his coat, which he had not worn since last year. And guess what? There was the missing snuff box. The duke was dreadfully distressed and found out that the old, uh, where the old officer was living and that he was living in a wretched garret. And he went to him and he apologized profusely. But he had to ask, why? Why did you not consent to what the other officers proposed and thus save yourself from this terrible suspicion? The officer replied, because, sir, my pockets were full of broken meat, which I contrived to put there to save my wife and family, who were at the time literally dying of starvation. So they had this great feast, and he was, rather than eating the feast, sticking food in his pockets for his family. The duke, it said, sobbed like a child, and it need not be added that the old officer and his family suffered no more from want from that day forward. Now, I I tell this story because uh, hopefully, I don't know for you, but for me, when when I read it, it just, it was a gut reaction. And I felt for this officer. And what it does is it illustrates, I think, um, the heart of this proverb. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30 says this. It says, Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet if he's caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it will cost him all the wealth of his health. Now, the nature of Proverbs is that it's general wisdom. This isn't thus saith the Lord. This isn't the law, if you would. It's general wisdom. But here's the general wisdom. In the first part, in verse 30, it says, when someone's caught taking food because they're hungry, it says, generally, we get it. Like that story. The Duke could have said, now, wait a second. Yes, you didn't steal the diamond snuff box, but you did kind of try to get away with food, right? But no, he doesn't, because he completely understands and is heartbroken over the situation of this soldier. And what we know to be true in all the statistics and everything that people look at, the vast majority of immigrants that come to the United States come so because of economics. Or they come, the second one is they come because of of political oppression. Most folks who come here to this country, uh, legally or illegally, come because they need to feed their families. And And if you want proof of this, Remember I said you know, that 30% of the illegal immigrants um, are in California? Every year, $18 billion goes from the United States to people in Mexico. $18 billion. Not to buy goods and services. I'm talking about sent to individual family members to help support them back in Mexico. They're not coming to buy a bigger house and get a great car. They're coming to help their families back home. Not all, but a lot. $18 billion worth. And one of the moral principles for you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, as believers of God and, and the one who created us, is we show grace and understanding to those who have to do what they do because they have to survive. Now, there's another side of this coin, though. This proverb doesn't stop in verse 30. In 31, it says, if you are caught, though, you must pay sevenfold, though it costs you the wealth of your household. What this proverb says is we understand, but then it says to the one who takes it, but that doesn't let you off the hook. We understand why you take it. God doesn't say uh, necessarily you're going to be super judged because you did take it, but he did say this. There should be consequences. It is still wrong. It is still, the moral principle is, it is still morally wrong. And and the justice issue is, there should be, if if you're caught, there should be a price for that moral choice. Do you see the, the two sides of that coin? Now again, that's general moral guidance because it comes from the book of Proverbs. All right? Now, I did find one place in the scripture where God pretty much gives us a command and it's, and it's directly aimed at immigration or immigrants, actually. 
And so in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, I also uh, gave you a few verses in your handout from Exodus and Leviticus. So this is actually talked about all throughout the Hebrew scriptures. It says this, he being God, God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien. That's what the word would be for an immigrant. Giving him food and clothing. And then in verse 19, it turns to you and I now. And you are to love those who are aliens. For you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Remember, he's talking to the Jewish people here. He has brought them out of Egypt. He's about to take them into the promised land. And he says this, I'm going to give you this land. This will be your nation. But here's my command. First of all, know my heart. I love, I love those who cannot help themselves. I love widows. I love orphans. And, and I love the immigrant among you. And they says, when you get in this land, here is my command for you. This is what I want you to do. Love them too. We are commanded to love the immigrant. You may not like some of the effects. You may not like what some of them do. But you are commanded, like or not like, to love them. When we approach this issue, we've got to come from a place of love. And God specifically, in, in the Jews' case, says, don't forget that you, you too, were in that situation. Which brings me to my last, uh, uh, actually, before I go there, I, I do want to mention this. The Bible is filled with immigrants, okay? If you remember Abraham, the, the one who started the whole faith journey, the reason he's commended for his faith because he immigrated from the nation that he was in, where he was safe and secure, was his own, and just trusted God when God said, go move to somewhere where you have no inheritance, where you will be an immigrant. Jacob also had to run from Esau and was an immigrant in a foreign land. The whole story of, the, of Egypt and the Jews. Joseph first was sent down as a slave, as a slave immigrant to Egypt, and then his family followed right because of a famine. They were poor. They had no money. They didn't want to live in Egypt, but they were forced there because that's where the abundance of food was. It was actually part of God's provision for them. And then that's when they grew into a nation, and then you had that huge conflict. They were fine when they were just a family. Does this sound familiar? There was just a few of them. It was fine. But when all of a sudden they started competing for resources, if you would, with the Egyptians, oh, now it's a controversy. And what did the Pharaoh did? He used the controversy to his advantage. Sound familiar? We know where God stood on that issue. Two of the most famous um, immigrants in the Bible and Jesus, and Jesus lineage are Rahab and Ruth, both immigrants, non-Jews at, at that side. David, you remember David was an illegal immigrant. When he, Saul was chasing him, David illegally, without permission, snuck into Philistine territory to hide out. Amen. <laughs> God reminds them to love the immigrant, which then leads us to the golden rule, if you would. Matthew 7, 12 says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. You want to know the heart of God, do to others what you have them do to you. I'm going to uh, say it in an another way. I'm going to use the words of Henry David Thoreau says this. The best thing a man can do for his culture when he is rich is to endeavor to carry out those schemes which he entertained when he was poor. The best thing a man could do or a woman can do when they're rich is to endeavor to carry out those schemes that they entertain when they were poor means this. When you are finally get your place of power, maybe it's legal status, maybe it's economic power, maybe you're finally the boss, maybe you're finally the lead pastor. When you start thinking about what, how you should act and the decisions you should make, you should go back to when you weren't in that place of power. You should go back and think, what about when my ancestors came over? You might, some of you might be surprised at, at uh, how many of our ancestors came over and kind of fudged a little bit to get in, or a lot of it, 
to get in. And, and what we would want others to do, we need to do also. We need to do also. That, that is God's heart. It's just say, when you're in, here you are. This is your country. But now as you look at this issue, don't look at it from your place to their place. Remember or put yourself in a similar situation when you were wearing their shoes. Now make decisions. Now make policy. Now talk about what's right or wrong. That's what followers of Jesus do. Because he was a man who was humble. He was a man who laid his life down for those who should serve him. And we should do the same. So, if I had to wrap it up, I would have to say, encourage you with this, okay? We, those of us who follow Jesus, and that's the big qualifier, those of us who follow Jesus and, and, and have wholeheartedly received that he did for us what we could not do ourselves, and who wholeheartedly not only said, Jesus, you are the Christ, Messiah, but you are Lord, which means it's your way, not my way. We've got to remember that we have a different priority than everybody around us. Our priority is different. You see, the issue for us isn't protection, it's advancement or advancing, right? The issue for us isn't protecting our children, protecting our jobs, protecting our country, protecting our economy, protecting the American way. That is not the issue for you and I. We're not in the business of protection because we belong to another kingdom. We're in the business of advancing God's kingdom. And so we don't look at this issue as what is best for us. We look at this issue and say, what is best for God's kingdom? We don't look at it the same way. We see it and we see an opportunity to, to uh, stand up for people who need to be stood up for. We see it as an opportunity to love people that need to be loved. We see it as an, as an opportunity to, to serve kids and families that are hurting. The issue is completely different for us than political. Because our hope is not in a president who gets it right. Because what do we know? None of them are going to ever get it right. I mean, do you really believe God's word? Because if you do, you shouldn't be shocked when they all say one thing on election day and it completely changes once they're elected. We, that's the way of the world. That's why we have a hope in something different. That's why we sing, oh, to be like you, Jesus. Can you imagine if they asked Jesus, Jesus, what do you think about immigration? What do you think about what Trump said? What do you think about what Hillary said? You think Jesus would answer that question? I don't, I don't know what he would say, but I imagine Jesus saying something like, well, whose country really is this? Who really owns the land? Right? Not, not, not putting down issues of justice. And, I mean, you know, there's something about, about um, a nation securing its borders, and I'm, I'm not undermining that, but I'm just saying it's a different issue for Jesus. We say, we say, we'll give all I have just to know you. It's about knowing him, not about protecting me. Jesus, there's no one beside you. It's your opinion that matters. Forever, you're the hope in my heart. My hope is not that the political leaders finally figure it out. My hope is in you, Jesus. My hope is in your kingdom. And our time and our energy and our righteous, if you would, indignation should be for his kingdom. Not for anything of this world. And we get involved in the things of this world when it advances his kingdom. So I'm not saying the political arena is completely wrong. Because I think it can be used for issues of justice. It can be used for issues of mercy. They're just framed differently than we usually talk about. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Father God. 
So, Lord, I, I know um, I have often, I just admit before you, looked at this situation in terms of my own personal political philosophy, sometimes erring on the side of grace, sometimes erring on the side of the truth, but centrally, it's how I feel about it and what's best for me and my family. And I ask you that you forgive me. I ask that you forgive us, dear Lord, for forgetting that it's not about protection, but it's about advancing your kingdom. And so I pray to God, first of all, that your kingdom may be advanced in our own hearts. We need a heart change, Lord. Where there's debate, we need love. Where there, where there is wrestling over right and wrong, we need, we need grace and a mission-minded focus, dear God. Do that in us. And then, Lord, open our eyes to opportunities within this issue, dear God, and and issues like it, dear Lord, um, to advance your kingdom. If that means supporting a a neighbor, dear Lord, if it it means going before you and and repenting, dear Lord, because um, we have treated this issue uh, not with the seriousness that it deserved, dear Father. um, Whatever the situation may be, dear God, may we honor you, in that, dear Lord. And I do pray for our leaders that you may give them wisdom beyond what they have because this is a hard one, dear God. This is a hard one to truly be just and right. Um, So I pray that you give them wisdom and then the courage to do, um, follow you where you have led, dear Lord. May that begin with the people in this room, with your church all around the world, dear God, that we may advance your kingdom. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.